good evening all. Hopefully you're having a great weekend and, uh, well, maybe you're having better weather than us. That can't be hard at the minute down here on the Thames Estuary. Mark's one side of the water, I'm the other. But we're here together for episode eight of Windows on the World Live. And uh, how are you doing, Mark? Very well, Tony. I've been doing a lot of research and people who've been looking at the YouTube channel might have spotted that there hasn't been any videos up for some time for the last week now, but I've got several that are waiting to go up there. And what we're going to do, I think, now is put up some of the longer interviews that I've already filmed alongside some of these shorter introductions to some of the shows that we're going to be doing. Uh, And the show that we're going to be doing tonight is all about the new age and the deception of the new age. Now, I think that's a very, very important thing to approach at this period in time. I I agree with you. It's been going on for a long while. And despite a few pretty high profile figures over the years getting involved with this and trying to point people in the right direction, it still seems to be gathering force, but it changing and morphing into different forms. So it's uh, pretty important because I hear it all the time in people's speech and uh, it gets quite frightening when you really know what it's all about. So. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, the implications of this are very, very deep. And, I mean, we've all been through it. We've all looked into this stuff. And I'd like to go into the foundation of it, where it actually came from, and just talk about it in the way of an introduction. Because I don't think people realise that this is a big part of global governance and the new world order. There are many that do. But what I'd like to do is be able to join the dots and give people a bit more insight because over the years I've met a lot of people within this so-called New Age movement and most of them are pretty well-intentioned. But one thing I've noticed uh, is that it tends to make people extremely self-centred egotistical and very very deluded and also they get involved in so-called spiritual practices that they are not equipped to deal with and that is something that goes into the first couple of people who we need to talk about in new age which was madame helena petrova blavatsky and later on alice bailey and they both channeled the same entity but first of all Let's just go into a brief background of what this whole thing's about. Um, As I say, we want to help people to spot these fake gurus and the beliefs that are being implanted into the minds of the gullible. Um, And well-meaning, for sure, you know, there's a lot of well-meaning people who are involved in this and sort of restore truth and natural law in place of this self-deception and manipulation because the real new age of natural law is about truth and that's what we should be looking at now, the real the real new age, which is the new age of natural law and truth. Now, the whole idea of the new age was spread by people, including the UN Secretary General Robert Mueller and, of course, Murray Strong. And out of all this uh, UN involvement came Agenda 21, the Earth Charter, the Kyoto Protocols. And previous to that, a lot of other acts, which we can go in a over the next few weeks. Now, this led into the Gaia hypothesis, which is behind all these fake environmental religions and religious policies, and directly through Alice Bailey. Now, Alice Bailey is quite an interesting person here because when we look into Alice Bailey, what we find is an egotist, vain, self-centered, who all of a sudden became possessed. And she wanted to spread her enlightenment through this possession by this entity called KH, which was previously channeled by Madame Blavatsky and identified as one of the ascended masters into basically global governments through Freemasonry. Now, people may not realize that, that the New Age movement was hugely, hugely co-opted by the UN and Freemasons. Well, my understanding of it is probably not that great, but it came from cultural Marxism, I believe. And uh, they're all kind of tools tools of the same people, is that right? Well, they are, because we covered Yuri Besmanov and and how he used, or the Soviets used, useful idiots to basically put across these messages to subvert the population. We've also talked about that the population has to be a willing target of subversion. 
And that's very important. And people who are involved in this new age cult are willing targets of subversion. And the result of that is fractured minds, um, petty narcissism, egotism, and all the things that are really part of this cultural Marxism, as you're saying. It ties in exactly with these principles. And of course, it's about one world government, one world religion and global communism. But what we need to do is strip away these sort of artificial wounds which have been created through the deception of these e egotists and their globalist ideologies. And the creators, as we said, are the new age, were globalists and Freemasons. And spiritual self-deception is one of the most useful weapons of disempowerment. And it is a big part of this subversion. So the influence of the new age has had a huge effect and was co-opted and used for global governance. It's successfully disempowered the global, destroyed spiritual power in favour of this apathetic acceptance of everything under the guise of detachment, along with a cult of nothing, which is really centred around narcissism. Now, the two narcissists who we've just mentioned, who helped pioneer the new age movement through these writings and channeled works, by these entities that seem to have taken them over, and Madame Pro Petro Elena Petrova Blavatsky and Alice Bailey. Now, the thing is that Alice Bailey became the prominent voice in the New Age following on from Blavatsky. Um, and they both actually advocate Luciferian one world government. The writings of both of these women are a mixture of sort of enthusiastically adopted, but not critically examined fragments of Eastern philosophy, especially Hinduism. And that's mixed with sort of this vague and simplistic interpretation of science. And that's very important. They always talk about science and spirituality and bringing that together. And these references are very obscure. These references to occultism, which sort of fed their self obsession with being thought of as visionaries. So these two are hugely egotistical. And like a lot of the new age people, they didn't question where this information came from. They didn't really even question whether it was a good or bad thing. Um, now, Blavatsky's writings include Isis Unveiled and Bailey's writings include 24 books, including externaliz externalization of the hierarchy and the seventh ray. That's quite important. They talk about the seventh ray, which is coming from the solar logos. And we can talk about the, the seven rays in weeks to come. But people can look those up in the meantime and how they've influenced other people, such as David Icke. Now, their influence can be seen everywhere in the world of the new age and it's among its um, self-appointed sort of snake oil merchants basically the ped peddling everything you see it all over the place all kinds of therapy self-help and belief systems and it's all based around narcissism and basically acquiescing from all responsibility um the idea of a lot of new age people is that they say, oh, I don't want to engage with anything negative. This is the biggest self-deception going and it all ties into positive thinking and all this kind of stuff which became part of the new age. All these people who peddled it like Deepak Chopra, Sri Shinmoy, Vera Stanley Alder, they were all basically disciples of these two women. And a lot of it is based around Hinduism because at the end of the 18th century, we had these rich Victorians who were traveling the world and they were finding out about these wonderful spiritual practices of India and they got totally wrapped up in it. Now, it is a very fascinating. Hinduism is quite fascinating, but Hinduism covers everything. Hindus can believe basically in what they want. They can they can ritually sacrifice animals or humans, dance around with skulls on their head. There, there is a God for everything. And a lot of Hinduism about detachment, it, the teachings, the original teachings of things like the Bhagavad Gita are very, very interesting and philosophical. But when these ideas are taken it's kind of literally about detachment, that's where we get the problem. Okay, well, to me, it seems like there's a very fine line between spiritualism and Satanism and what you've been talking about so far. I think that crosses the line if there is even one there for a lot of that. Yes, it ties into the one world religion, global governance under a new leader. Now, this is the interesting thing that Blavatsky and Bailey were both Luciferians. And in fact, you could say Satanists because this is a quote from 
um, H.P. Blavatsky. She states, and now it stands proven that Satan or the red fiery dragon, the Lord of Phosphorus and Lucifer or light bearer is in us. It is our mind. Now, Blavatsky held court and facilitated these seances. And in 1875, she launched the Theosophical Society and she hooked up the game a bit searching out supernatural beings. So in other words, she didn't want to just be talking to dead people. She wanted to be talking to very, very powerful, spiritually advanced dead people, the Mahatmas, she called them, whom Blavatsky had allegedly met in Tibet. She's meant to have met some of these so-called ascended masters. Now, her parlor games were revealed and the trickery it's a bit like that Oscar Wilde play. Is it Lady, Lady Windermere's fan where you have the the very theatrical woman doing the seances going, is anybody there? Is anybody there? <laughs> oh, you're here. So what do you like to say to us? Uh, one lock for yes, one for no. Are you happy? Oh, good. And all of this was exposed. Blavatsky was basically doing this and she was investigated by the Society for Psychical Research and found out to be an absolute fraud. So she was just a, a kind of interesting show, show person, really. She was a kind of travelling circus. But what she did have was the ability to convince people um, through her storytelling and her channelling. So in other words, if something's channelled, then it doesn't have to be proven. It's just, this is the channelled word of the master, that's it. You have to accept it, you see. So Blavatsky channeled um, these masters, these ascended masters, along with Alice Bailey, who came after her. And the work of these two is basically the catalyst for all these fake cults, fake gurus and fake spirituality. So basically we can have a look at some of the quotes now, which will lead people into what sort of uh, person Alice Bailey was. Um, the, As I said, the... Society for Psychical Research had already unmasked Blavatsky and they they were actually not too unkind to her really they just said they didn't call her a complete charlatan they just said that she was basically um, quite an interesting imposter those are the sort of words they used but this is typical of um, the sort of egotism now from Alice Bailey and she obviously started the Lucifer Trust in the 1920s, and it became the Lucis Trust as it is today. And this is linked into the UN. They, they attend the UN. They attend UN meetings globally. And this is what she said about herself. Undertake the constant distribution of my books, which contain much of the teaching of the new age. In the last analysis, the books are your working tools and the instruments whereby you will train your workers. See that they are kept in steady circulation. So you can see from this that she's a cult leader. Um, now, she, she was a very privileged rich girl who states about herself, I am miserable. I had not asked to be born. Nobody loved me and I had a hateful disposition. So she's very spoiled. When she visualized her guru, K.H., one of the ascended masters, she found out later it was an ascended master, yeah? Um, Blavatsky claimed to have channeled the same entity. She stated, he told me I would travel the world doing the master's work all the time. He would get in touch every few years. I felt smug satisfaction, she says. Now, if you've been enlightened by something, would you feel smug satisfaction? I don't think I would, no. No, it's not the the sort of way to describe a spiritual experience, is it? I don't think so. She, she carries on, Tony. She says, I felt that I was Joan of Arc, and like her, I was seeing spiritual visions and was consequently set aside for a great work. I pictured myself as the dramatic and admired teacher of thousands. I was under observation and was doing what he wanted me to do. He told me things were planned. He did not tell me what to do. The masters never do. The master is a busy executive and his job is world direction. Now, doesn't that sound a bit like a global governance under the United Nations? It sounds exactly like how they'd like us to feel about that, I think, yes. Yeah. 
she carries on. He never runs around talking sweet platitudes to perfectly mediocre people whose influence is nil and whose power to serve is undeveloped. Now, the arrogance of her statements that's so typical of the narcissism of these new age people. And it's the danger of the cult of the guru. Now, the UN Secretary General, Robert Mueller, took on board the New Age cult and the Lucis Trust, along with many gurus and spiritual organizations, some of which we've talked about, all came under the banner of this new global governance. Now, if we go forward a bit, to 1983 it was the first mind body and spirit festival now i've just been to a mind body and spirit festival they still run um but this was a biggie it was in california and it brought together all of these groups that would form partnerships with the united nations including the brahma kumaris who we spoke about several weeks ago so it's quite interesting now the lucis trust it states on the website is aggressively involved in promoting a globalist ideology that's part of their world goodwill intent statement. And they are affiliated with the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Commission. It says about the Lucis Trust here. The Lucis Trust has consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations and world goodwill is recognised by the Department of Public Information at the United Nations as a non-governmental organisation. As such, the Trust and World Goodwill are part of a community of many hundreds of NGOs that will play an active role in the United Nations, particularly in spreading information about the UN and fostering support for UN programmes. Since their inception, Lucis Trust and World Goodwill have given their support through meditation, educational materials and seminars by highlighting the importance of the UN's goals and activities as they represent the voice of the peoples and nations of the world. Now, so they're stating that they now represent the voice and the peoples and the nations of the world. Now, the interesting thing about this, Tony, is that the new age does not accept anybody outside it. When the UN say in Agenda 21, nobody will be left behind, that's exactly what they mean. They mean nobody will be allowed to have a different opinion. Now, the, this is very, very interesting. The UN, as we've discussed before, and any of their agencies, which includes the Lucis Trust, are above international law. All their assets are inviolable, they cannot be prosecuted, and their assets cannot be inspected or seized. So basically, all of these organizations have not just diplomatic immunity, but immunity from prosecution worldwide. Just like the big banks. Exactly. Now, does that sound like goodness incarnate, or does it align more with power and control or Satanism? Uh, you know, option B. I think so. Um, but if, if people need to know a bit, I'm, I'm getting quite dense on the information here. But if people need to know a bit more about that, um, go to the 1947 UN Charter of Incorporation. It is linked onto an article on WindowsOnTheWorld.net. I think it's linked to Big Society Change Agents and or the Global Local Cabal. It's also mentioned in there. There's a video called a Global Local Cabal as well. Um, and there are videos on the um, the New Age's connection to these change agents with big society change agents. That's quite an interesting article. But um, Alice Bailey stated um, in a later life that in 50 years time, which is, well, we're just beyond 50 years after she said it. She said the need for true psychics and conscious mediums such as Blavatsky will be very great if the master's plans are to be carried through to fruition and the movement must be set on foot in preparation for the coming of him for whom all nations wait. Get that, yeah? In preparation for the coming of him for whom all nations wait. This is where they're talking about this global leader or Maitreya, which is really Lucifer as stated by Blavatsky and also Alice Bailey. Yeah, interesting, eh? Yeah, very interesting. I've uh, got a question here from Mahatma. He says, does Mark know if the Lucius Trust can be documentably linked to the Baha'i Faith? Now, that is something we can look at and a really good point. Thanks for making that. Yeah, Lee, Lee's put a comment in there just after. I think the Baha'i uh, Faith was formed around 198, uh, sorry, 1888 the time frame may be a coincidence or something like that yeah well that's about the right time i mean that would be the right time because well alice bailey was born in 1880 
but this stuff was already well underway with the teachings of Blavatsky. Now, what I wanted to do this week is give a little bit of an overview, really, because we can go back into Blavatsky and some of the things she said and more of what Bailey said. But I think in, in a way it's more important what Bailey says at this at this introductory point, because she was the one whose writings were taken very, very seriously. As we've already discussed, Blavatsky was completely unmasked for, for the fraud that she was. Probably a very interesting character, but a complete chancer. But the, well, the interesting thing about all this is that these people with a bit of charisma, she appeared, she did her uh, spiritual spiritualism, she did her seances, she gathered people around her, she was very theatrical. And it's amazing, isn't it, that people flock to these kind of gurus um, or personalities. And I've noticed it a lot, and it's very, very dangerous, because whenever somebody comes into this truth movement, and, and gets a lot of attention very quickly, they're always a wrong one, always. Yeah. They, uh, with, we've never, ever been to a situation where anybody who's come in who's massively promoted has not been promoting this stuff or the, or the one world government or basically been a communist subversive. They all are. Yeah, but it's something about that theatrical uh, approach because uh, Alex Jones springs to mind now and uh, a few others in the so-called truth movement and uh, very theatrical, very well funded and it gets a lot of people watching or listening so it seems, I don't know, there's a bit of two things going on there. One, one people already understand it. The more fi- theatrical you are, the more useful idiots that are going to follow along with you and uh, the, yes. the, obviously then you've got the useful idiots themselves that are just sort of like making it easy. So Yes, no, that's absolutely true. Um, in fact, here's a quote from Aldous Huxley, who knew about all this stuff way before it happened. And he's one of his quotes is, an unexciting truth may be eclipsed by a thrilling lie. And that's all this is about. Because the truth to most people is not that exciting. They want it wrapped up with bells on it. And they want a mystery. And we can go into that in the next few weeks because that also ties back into the Rosicrucian order, which was originally set up just as a way of gaining attention for people who had some ideas. I'm not saying their ideas were good or bad. It was a brilliant idea. They became an invisible organization that nobody could work out who was a member, who wasn't. And it's a great idea. It's a really good idea. And we could take a leaf out of their book to get some publicity. But... The point is that it proves that people love a mystery. They love something that's intangible, that's not really real. And I think that quote from Huxley sums it up. He also states, wherever the choice has to be made between the man of reason and the madman, the world has unhesitatingly followed the madman. Another brilliant quote. Because Huxley foresaw the coming one world government. He's he's brilliantly describing how the global action plan has been implemented there. Yep. And he's, I was going to do these quotes at the end, but we could do them now, actually. But he also said, there will be in the next generation or so a pharmacological method of making people love their servitude and producing dictatorship without tears, so to speak, producing a kind of painless concentration camp for entire societies so that people will, in fact, have their liberties taken away from them, but will rather enjoy it. That's exactly what's happened, isn't it? It is, yes, exactly. And still more of it going on every day, loads of it. They keep coming out with more ideas to get more people involved in the same nonsense every day. Oh, that's exactly right. And when we look at this this new age thing, it's co-opted so many people and it's massive. It's absolutely huge. I mean, I don't think there's an area even within the truth movement that's not infected with this stuff. I have problems with people who go to some of these festivals and they sit around campfires talking this nonsense as though they have been on the planet for thousands of years. Hard. And they're speaking with this authority that just belies their, their lack of knowledge. Because people who know the power of spirituality tend to hold back on it. But these people are full force with all their channeling, all their information, all of their healing and all the rest of it. I know lots of people who got into healing. Healing is quite an easy thing. I mean, this is a bit of a side issue, but something like Reiki obviously works. I mean, this is just transference of energy. But what they do is they go into a whole big thing about it. 
and then it gets rather abstract and then you get things like the seven rays and all this intangible stuff um, that which they try and associate with science but it's not science because science is stuff that's proven by analysis and fact and none of this is it's all conjecture and mainly in the minds of the people who are promoting it and this came as a big shock to me because I was involved with some of these people these Hindus who were in these sects and I always found them very very interesting and I assumed because they'd studied all this stuff and they'd read the Bhagavad Gita and they knew all of these Hindu scriptures that I'd never read that they were somehow some kind of big authority on the subject and then when you ask them questions you find out they don't know anything and that to me was a really good wake up call because I I don't criticise people usually some people listen to the show may disagree but but when, when I'm given information I do I do check it out properly I don't like because I'm conscientious about this I don't like putting out stuff that's just going to basically thrill people and hoodwink them into something. I like to back things up and say, well, I've tried this and it seems to work. Take it back down to our legal stuff again. You know, we tried this stuff on paper. This approach seems to work and it works because of this. This is the concept and the reason why it works. Now, I was going to talk extensively and will do about out of body experiences, which is something that I've studied for a very long time. Um, and all of that kind, all of those experiences get lumped in with this new age stuff, and that isn't new age. Yes. That is a very, very important and serious thing to talk about yeah. because it's it's something that one in ten of the population have experienced, and it takes us to a much bigger realization than this new age stuff. In that there is a very strong possibility that consciousness does survive the death of the body, and that's really what all this is about. It's about giving people this kind of idea of infinity and consciousness. Now, the word consciousness is just used as some kind of byword for everything now, isn't it, Tony? Yeah, it's uh, something no one actually knows what consciousness is, but we all assume that we do, and uh, it's been packaged up and uh, sold along with the out-of-body experience, meditation, and uh, all sorts of other things along the line. And I'm really keen to talk about that myself with you, because... There's not many people I will talk about that sort of thing with because of the reasons that, that you're going to go into. Yeah, I think it's really important, Tony, because I take it very very seriously. And the experiences that I had with out of body stuff is profound and I don't talk about it much. It's interesting, actually. I was talking to a very good friend of mine I've known for years at this little gathering we went to last week. And... We got onto that subject and I was talking about the danger of all this new age waffle that was going around. I said, I can't, I can't bear to listen to it anymore. And I said to him, I'd studied out of body experience and I told him who I'd studied out of body experiences with, the experiences I'd had, the training, what it goes into people like Robert Monroe, Charles Tart, um, the, uh, basically these were scientists who were looking at these experiences objectively. And he was really shocked. This is a friend of mine I've known for 15 years. He goes, God, I didn't know you were into all that. I said, yeah, but I don't talk about it on this level because it's serious and it's profound and it's deeply sort of spiritual stuff, really. And when you give it this kind of surface gloss of consciousness and expanding consciousness and being able to, you know, um, empower yourself and it all becomes back to this completely narcissistic, self-referential kind of crap that the new age has used as a weapon very cleverly it's disempowered millions of people so these people think they're empowered through this sort of fake knowledge and these fake gurus but basically they're just again turkeys voting for christmas this is basically acquiescence into a police state that's all the new age is it's, it's about acquiescing giving away your power to something that looks fluffy which is police state control of your entire life through agenda 21 now Here's a good example. Uh, Alice Bailey, a good quote from her again. The Masonic movement is the custodian of the law. It is the home of the mysteries and the seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity 
and the way for salvation is pictorially preserved in its work. It is a far more occult organization than can be realized and is intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultists. In its ceremonials lie hid the wielding of the forces connected with the growth and life of the kingdoms of nature and the unfolding of the divine aspects of man. That's Alice Bailey. She goes on. There is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. These mysteries will be restored to outer expression through the medium of the church and the Masonic fraternity. When the Great One comes with his disciples and initiates, we shall have the restoration of the mysteries and their exoteric presentation as a consequence of the first initiation. Now, amongst all that gobbledygook, she's she's talking about one world government under Satan, basically. That's what she's really saying there. And we've already had that quote from Blavatsky. Now, Bailey referred to this coming one world government in her book, Externalization of the Hierarchy. Uh, so we can go into a lot more of these quotes, but it's absolutely clear what this is about. We've started off with Blavatsky talking about Luciferianism and Satan. She basically says that Satan is us. We are Satanists. And Bailey is carrying that work on. And these women both channeled the same entity. And they both were very influential, but Bailey much more so because obviously she's, to recap, she co-opted the UN and hundreds of NGOs, and she's given this new Luciferian movement a platform worldwide under global governance. Yes, and it seems to be taking in the non-religious into a religion that's kind of not glossed as a religion, but it is a religion sort of thing. So there seems to be several faces to this like honeypot that keeps uh, sucking people in. Yes. They try and combine their, the, all the world's religions through what they call interfaith organisations. Now, interfaith organisations are basically the destruction of religion and especially the destruction of Christianity. Now, when I got into all this stuff years ago, I bought into it to a certain extent, but I was always fairly sceptical. And then... When I found out about all this stuff that goes back to Hinduism and having been to Hindu countries and seen what Hinduism really is, it's a massive eye opener because, again, they're using an aspect of Hinduism, which is about acquiescence. It's about giving away your power. Now, these people are power obsessed. So if they're gurus are obsessed with power and we're giving our power away to them what does that make us that makes us very very silly because when we're talking about power we're not talking about a control system in that respect we're talking about our personal ability to have inner truth and to observe natural law that's what we're talking about the destruction of inner truth and natural law yeah it makes us useful idiots exactly and we've talked about them quite a lot, haven't we? Yeah, I can't stop thinking about them because it just sums it up so perfectly. Yeah. Well, here's, let's go now into some of this abstract waffle that these people talk. This again is Alice Bailey. She wrote, one of, the most, one of the results of the world condition at this time is the speeding up of all the atomic lives upon and within the planet. Now, what she's referring to there is something that is actually real. But what they do is they take it into this area, which has been taken on by people like David Icke, talking about the photon belt and, and of course, um, the, the big consciousness. And basically, everything's one. You know, what they've done is they've, they've subverted this oneness that you can get through meditation into a kind of generic oneness within a power structure, which is global control. So it's quite clever. And unless you can separate those two things, then it's difficult. But ironically, the way to separate them is to actually be able to go into the meditative state, because then you can see that, yes, there is a oneness There is a consciousness behind everything. But what these people are advocating is the manipulation of that materially in front of you. 
Yes, and that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and they're also advocating that you can manipulate your own material world and your material life with these techniques as well. Which uh, I've I've not got a problem with positive thinking, but actually thinking or believing that you can manifest things by thinking like that. I think that's uh, pushing it a bit far. I did try it a few times. I've got to admit to that, and didn't get much result out of it because it is a bit bit like praying, really. Uh, not a lot happens. Well, it it is down to the sort of intention behind it, and I think what it is, it's a fake intention because when you see reality, reality you can't see it as good or bad. You can see, yeah, there's a lot of bad things happening, but you have to look beyond that. And I was at these people who should know better. This guy's wife, we started talking to her and she was saying, oh yes, but you're just being so negative. And by engaging with it, you're bringing it on yourself. And I thought this was one of the most deluded and absurd things I'd ever heard because if you confront something, you have to know your enemy. You have to know what you're dealing with. Yeah. You have to know that the New Age is about Luciferianism and the destruction of Christianity. You have to know these things. These aren't good or bad. This is just fact. So what these people do is they acquiesce into a dream world, which is what Huxley was talking about, a painless concentration camp, pharmacologically induced. And there, the inducement of this deception is not even through drugs, even though drugs have played a part in it. But with all these experiences, like ayahuasca and all this stuff. Now, I'm not going into whether that's good or bad. I'm just saying that that's a big part of what this is about, these experiences. So let's go on to now where this goes into the new age, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Remember hair and all that in the 60s? Well, all of this was a follow on from what Blavatsky was talking about they were saying that the Piscean Age was going to die and this new age of Aquarius would bring in enlightenment on, with, on the planet or the light not enlightenment, their light which as we know is Lucifer or Satan okay, so this is one of Bailey's comments this period marks the close of one age and the inauguration of the new the inauguration, in other words the initiation, the inception the ritual and she carries on. These atoms, which are predominantly Piscean, are beginning to slow down their activity and be occultly withdrawn, as it is called or abstracted. Whilst those which are responsive to the New Age tendencies are, in their turn, being stimulated and their vibrationary activity increased. So this is total manipulation. She's stay saying that because... Uh, we've come into this new age that atoms are changing and we've heard this from a lot of people with people saying DNA is changing and we've got indigo children now the indigo children that I've met are just hyperactive spoiled brats um, it's not not their fault but they're just that's what they are you know and, they, and the parents are going they're indigo children they're all being born to bring light into the world well they don't seem to be doing that because the ones that have grown up that I know aren't doing that at all hmm. you know um, so, yeah, this, so she carries on. Certain members of the planetary hierarchy are approaching closer to the Earth at this time. These are these ascended masters. The Christ and certain of his great disciples, the masters of wisdom, are directed or focused at this time on human affairs. Some of them may break their long silence and may appear later among men. Now, this is the appearance of the global lead. You see, I think we've had several of these leaders. I think people like most recently Obama was one of these people that they chose. They chose him as a Luciferian for the one world government. He was completely compromised. He was a puppet. And it's like a, a sick joke with him and his so-called wife. When you look at what they are, um, they were just compromised completely. And I think this is really what they mean by their leaders. They mean these compromised people who are put up like Macron in France. He's one of them. So I don't think they're talking about one leader. I think they're talking about a succession of these people who are working towards this global governance. Um, yes, it's very interesting, isn't it, Tony? Because we've got we've got all these quotes from her. And here's, here's another one. All true spiritual thinkers and workers 
are much concerned at this time about the growth of crime on every hand by the display of the lower psychic powers, by the apparent deterioration of the physical body as shown in the spread of disease, and by the extraordinary increase in insanity, neurotic condition and mental unbalance. Well, that's really ironic because an increase in insanity, neurotic condition and mental unbalance is a direct result of a lot of these practices. And as, as this is the result, it carries on, as this is the result of the tearing of the planetary web, part of the evolutionary plan providing the opportunity whereby humanity may take its first step forward, its next step forward, rather. So this is rather dictatorial for someone who's meant to be channeling the words of an ascended master, isn't it? It is. It seems like the stall's well and truly laid out as well. Like you know, this uh, there seems to be quite a bit of hypocrisy in this uh, new age jargon. I keep noticing along the way. Um, well, absolutely. I mean, in nineteen seventeen, it was interesting that um, that Bailey moved to Hollywood, um, and she set up the theos- where well, this is where the Theosophical Society HQ was, which is originally originally obviously set up by Blavatsky and in 1918 she met her master um, in the Theosophical Society there's pictures of these masters of the wisdom so she saw a picture and decided it was one of them you see so you can see how all this goes can't you it's basically self-deception she, she saw these pictures and then she goes it was the visitor it was the master my master KH and in 1919 she made contact with the Tibetan now, these two seem to get rather mixed up, these entities. Um, and a voice said to her, there are some books which are desired to be written for the public. You can write them. <laughs> so this woman is deluded on a level that most people couldn't possibly even imagine. It's pretty shocking stuff, really. And she carries on, Tony. I had a peculiar gift for the higher telepathy. And what I was doing was nothing to do with lower psychicism. In other words, she's far superior to everybody else because she's got an, she's doing the work of the Ascending Master. She's doing it through Freemasonry and One World Governance. She's special. She's been chosen. This is her role. She's been told to write these books. Does this remind you of anybody else, Tony? Uh, it reminds me of a lot of people in the modern past, really. It yeah. uh, seems to be a bit of a fashion guru syndrome. Yes. On steroids, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. In 1921, she met Foster, a new husband, and then they set up this publishing company, the Lucifer Trust. And shortly after, she went to Switzerland and met, met up with this woman called Olga Captain and Carl Jung, and also this guy, Roberto Asiagioli. And he founded the psychological movement known as Psychosynthesis. Now, I've read a bit about Sagioli. He was actually quite interesting because he was taking things a step up from Freud and saying that basically there is a higher consciousness. So to his credit, that's quite interesting. But the whole work of psychosynthesis is again tied into what we've been talking about, all this mind control stuff and political correctness, psychological subversion, cultural Marxism, you name it, climate change. It all goes into this stuff because all this stuff has been thought out psychologically. So there's no truth in it. It's all psychological subversion. Seems that way to me. But these people became hugely influential. For instance, she was a friend of Alexander, the Grand Duke, the brother-in-law, basically, of the Tsar of Russia, who was the author of the book The Religion of Love. Now, the loosest trust by this time had offices in London, New York, Geneva. Um, And they still publish a magazine called The Beacon. And there was a woman called Vera Stanley Alden. Now, I read a book by her years ago called The Opening of the Third Eye. Again, it was 1960s New Age waffle, all centred around Eastern philosophy, especially Hinduism. And you'll find that they based it on Hinduism because Hinduism is basically anything goes. It doesn't matter whether it's a sex cult. It doesn't matter whether it's sacrificing humans, sacrificing animals or doing any other practice which people would consider to be perverted. It's all okay in Hinduism. 
because everyone's at a different level of spiritual involvement. And this is a big thing that Deepak Chopra says in all his books, that everything is, is tailored to your own level of consciousness. So in other words, that's saying that whatever you're drawn to is what you need, which is patently rubbish and completely misleading because people get drawn into things that are absolutely of no use to them. Yeah, I see. Another part of this philosophy is uh, that everything's an illusion and nothing's real, so nothing really matters. And that kind of maybe is why they turn the other cheek to that sort of thing and don't think twice about chopping animals up, stuff, whatever. Don't yes, it's, it's kind of automatic. I mean, when I was in Nepal, it was kind of shocking, really, at the Temple of Kali in Tehran. And they're basically just chopping up goats and chopping the heads off chickens all day long. It's like a production line of slaughter. Yeah. And, and it's just incredible, really. You know, you've got headless chickens flying around and you've got bloody smoke everywhere, people being anointed and, and horrible bells crashing and banging all over the place. It's, the, it's like a vision of hell, really. Yeah, it sounds uh, like it. I yeah, it's... You know, even from a distance here, it just it, it doesn't sound like something I'd want to be involved in. I don't know what could be spiritual about that. I mean, I've got not got a problem with killing an animal if I need to eat it. So, you know, there's a lot of people that will have a problem with me for that. But for just carrying on like that, the way, the way that they seem to be doing with animals screaming and that, is, is, how's that spiritual in any way? How's that good for anyone or anything? It's, it's, it's horrible, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's just paganism, really. It's sacrificing the animals to appease Kali, um, this crazy goddess who runs around with skulls around her neck, and she's basically the underworld, I suppose the Astarte or the Hecate character, really. I mean, it's incredible, really, how all this stuff ties up. I, I know but, you're, sorry, I know you're talking about specifically Hindus right now, or Hinduism, but... Is the New Age, they've got a, a bit of a thing with evil. They think it's necessary. It, you know, it, it needs to be here. Is, is this kind of, like, related to that, do you think, in some way? Yeah, it goes back to this thing about duality, um, good and bad, and that there is this kind of yin and yang balance. That's bringing in Taoism. But Taoism is actually a lot more responsible. And when you get into things like Zen Buddhism, you get into hyper-responsibility. That doesn't seem to be part of the New Age, though. That seems to have been left out. Zen Buddhism is quite interesting because that means taking responsible in daily life for all your actions and thinking carefully about them. And that is a very, very good thing to do. And also, they come up with some very profound things. They get you to examine what's what's a vase, for instance. Uh, I love these little things that they they use to wake people up basically to give them insight. And so they'll say that, you know, the vase is made of clay, but it's the space inside the vase that's useful. They, they come up with things like that. And I've always thought those were great because they make you think about things. They actually, they actually make you use your brain, whereas this other stuff is about acceptance. It's about accepting everything and not being conscious. Ironically, what they're doing is they're talking about consciousness, but they're doing it so that people become unconscious. Now, there's a big difference here because if you've got conscious awareness, it's very, very different than going around in a complete daze, which is what most people are doing. They're daydreaming. They're, they're going from one empty thought to another. But actual consciousness, to see behind what's going on, there is a silence behind everything. There, there actually is a kind of energy and, and a life force that is there all the time and I have been able to tune into it and it takes a long time because all this stuff about meditation very interesting because I saw all these people chanting and banging these bells and and doing all these mantras but really you should be able to do it by being silent that's the whole point of it exactly well I often meditate when I'm listening to music with my headphones on I meditate in the bath uh, I've never never done any omin or any of that stuff that I've read quite a bit about and never even bothered trying it. But for me, the route to meditation came through a flotation tank. I uh, I was lucky enough to experience that some years ago. I spoke to you and spoken about it on the radio as well. A lot of people have got into it. 
but I don't talk about it because to me it's like talking about let's say a psychedelic trip an acid trip a mushroom trip or something like that everyone thinks that they had the best trip ever and then they try and explain it to somebody else about how great it was and it sounds like a load of rubbish because there are no words for what happens in those experiences or there are very few and when you try and interpret those emotions and feelings that you get from the experiences and I'm, I'm still including meditation in this then you're you're in the same same area is there's no words for it you can't explain it to someone you can only experience these things for yourself i believe anyway I think the words that people have used to describe it, like unity consciousness and all this stuff, have just been hijacked, you see. So they get thrown around as though people can immediately understand what that is. I mean, I spent years doing this meditation stuff, and I saw a lot of different people. Some of them very good at it. They knew what they were talking about. But when it goes down to anything, when anything comes down to a superficial level, and it becomes ego-based, narcissistic, which is what this whole movement is very clever. It's, it preys on the stupidity of people. It really preys on them. And I went to the recent Mind, Body and Spirit Festival and there were some interesting people there. There was a girl there who's actually a very good psychic who's a friend of mine, uh, but I talked to her on a one-to-one basis and I just she's one of those people who I can just tell anything to. And she'll come back with a response because she's basically open, you know. There's no, there's no great mystery to any of this stuff. But she's often right in what she says. But that's just because she's able to open up to what I'm saying and react to it very spontaneously. Some people have that energy field. They're actually able to do that. But what I found there is that a lot of these people who are channeling stuff and psychics especially – create loads and loads of bad and confused energy around themselves and there's a few people at these events who can see that and they keep away from it all but what is there's a multitude of middle-aged women and middle-aged men who've been co-opted into this and you see them at these festivals and they're walking around with these with their flowery eastern trousers on and, and their silly uniform, which they all seem to wear. And they, it, it's an external show of this fake spirituality. It's very, very strange. I mean, yeah, I've, I don't like being around it, really. Well, I've got but, a question about it, yes. because uh, I've been meaning to ask you for this for a while. At, at the end of the night, do you get involved when they all join hands and start singing Kumbaya? No, I I got to text actually, Tony, and I must confess, I got a text from a friend of mine said, we're in the opening ceremony. And I thought, well, that's great. I'll have something to eat and a few beers and I'll go down a bit later. <laughs> Skip that bit. Skip that bit. I don't like standing around in a circle, praying and inviting in the spirits of the north, south, west and east with some woman on a huge ego trip shouting at the top of her voice looking very serious with a with a stick in her hand that's where i just go back to the van or have a wander and get in tune with nature (laughs) shall we say sounds like the best option to me we've got a question from unique lee the chat there's not many people in the chat tonight but those that are in there are making a pretty staunch contribution to what we're doing here And there is quite a people, out, a lot of people out there listening. So you're actually missing out on, uh, you know, some of the show by not being in the chat room at autonomousmedia.net. No, Tony, I'd love people to challenge me on this because it may sound as though I'm being incredibly harsh, but I've been around this for a very long time. I've been around it, God, now probably for the best part of my life in a way, because I was hanging around with hippies when I was about fourteen, fifteen. And I got involved with them. I got involved in the music stuff. And I was in North Wales and all the hippie movement were up there. The Bagwan people, Bagwan Sri Rajneesh, the orange people, they were all up there. There was lots of these little cults and lots of little belief systems. And a lot of these people were very intelligent. You know, there there was some very interesting people amongst them. But most of them were spouting a lot of drivel. And what happened was I spent a very long time looking into the sources of where 
they'd got their information from. And I think it's only really with the internet that we can now, at the click of a mouse, get everything we need. Otherwise, you'd have to be looking through these esoteric books, and most of them were just waffle. You'd never learned anything from these books. Nothing. They, especially if you look at Blavatsky's stuff and Bailey's, it's just pure waffle. But amongst the waffle are these hugely egotistical and scary statements that they make. Mm -hmm. And those are the things we need to pick out, really. But, yeah, I mean, I've been very involved with people who are around this for a very long time. And I know what the dangers of it are. I've been from everything, you know. And the thing is, the New Age covers everything from basically Reiki, alternative therapies, drinking your own urine, um, doing affirmations, positive thinking, and all this luciferic stuff that they do, but especially channeling. Okay. And channeling, I believe channeling is one of the most dangerous things on the planet because I've seen the results of it and I've seen people have become possessed through channeling and I've had first-hand experience of that and that is something I can say with some authority. And the, the, these people are allowing themselves to become demonically possessed and if those things get into you, they are incredibly destructive. They just destroy the host. They destroy the personality. You get schizophrenia. Mm. You get totally destructive behavior. I've come face to face with it. I've seen it. I know it exists. I know that sort of evil exists. And it's it's not what people think. It's not something that's easy to put back in the box. If you get a very powerful per person who's demonically possessed, they can do a lot of damage. Yeah, I think we could probably do an old show about that down the line. Can we get I on to Lee's yeah. question? Because it yeah, fits, sorry, Tony. No, it fits <laughs> right into what... <laughs> It fits right into what you was just saying there. Sorry about my volume keeps going up and down like a yo-yo. I don't know why that is, but... Uh, I can hear you fine. It doesn't. It seems to be okay, Tony, actually. Okay, I was wondering about the other end. But anyway, what's Mark's opinion on Wiccan females who promote witchcraft using menstrual blood, and what advice would you give the ones who believe it's a wonderful and or it's so wonderful and sacred? Well, Tony, the only thing I can say to that is Twickenham. That's where I had an experience of all that. I had um, a girlfriend who lived down there. It was a bit older than me. It's years ago now. She was right into all that. I'm not sure about the menstrual blood side of it, but I think that was kind of part of the empowerment thing, um, even though she was menopausal at the time. But um, what I would say is that, yes, this Wiccan thing and this neo-pagan thing is really interesting because she was heavily involved with that, and she set up this this Wiccan society, yeah, <laughs> in Twickenham, and they were all going to meet in the pub. And she said, "Well, now make sure that you know we don't draw too much attention to ourselves." So all these people came in with big bloody hats and sticks and huge pentagrams on and gowns and robes and horns on their head. It was just hilarious, right? Fancy dress night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah don't draw attention to yourself. We're having a wicked night down the crown on Friday, but keep it low profile. <laughs> Well, they all had to dress up, which is basically what the thing's about. It's about dressing up. It's for show, isn't it? I suspect it is. There's also a question here from uh, Stu uh, from earlier on. I'm not sure whether it was relative to something that we were talking about or something in the chat, but either way, have you seen the m murals in the World Bank? The World Bank? Yeah, mur murals on the wall. I think maybe we could discuss them at a later date, because I can't recall it at the moment, but do you want to describe it? No, I don't know. This was from right. Stu, and thanks to right. Stu as well. It's good no, to see him in there regular as well and always asking good questions and contributing in the chat. So cheers for that. I'll make a note of that and, yeah. and check that out. I mean, I think the thing is with this, Tony, is there's so much information. I, I did quite a lot of preparation for this tonight, so it's not as spontaneous as usual, but um, I've just when I do the groundwork for something, I like to get in all these quotes because I think they're really important. Yeah. So it's probably not as been as relaxed as we normally do, but I think there's a lot of information that it, it's very important that people know this because unless you know what these people are actually saying and, and how subversive it really is, yeah. then... You can't really tie the two together because 
the thing is with all this stuff, it, it, a lot of it is they talk about the new age as the goddess energy and the female energy and the Gaia and all that, but the Gaia thing was all co-opted into one world government. So the this is the thing, or the aspects of the goddess and all the rest of it. I mean, I mean there was people who were part of some ultra-Christian sect who were always having a go at yoga teachers saying they were all channeling. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that there's different types of yoga. You know, I mean, I, that's um, Hatha yoga. That's that's quite useful. Um, I don't think it's good that kids do it. I don't think kids should do yoga at all because they're still growing. They shouldn't be doing it. But they, they've, it's now that's been, become another thing, you see. Like, these things that wouldn't be taught in India to kids are taught to kids here, which they shouldn't be. Yeah. This, I mean, yoga, the, the, the Hatha yoga positions and the, the, the Stanga yoga and all that, these were done by people who were very advanced. I mean, I had that guy's book, um, BKS Iyengar, and he's looked about 100 years old at the time. And he, I mean, some of these postures, you wouldn't believe them. I mean, I couldn't get anywhere near it now, you know. And you just do some basic ones as a stretch. As, and it, this, these aspects of it that are useful, it doesn't mean that if you're stretching that you're channeling anything. Uh, you know, some people take it to the extreme, and I don't want to do that. But this, there is a tendency with people who get too much into it. They get taken over by it. And I don't think they can handle the energy, whether they want to call it the Kundalini experience or something else or just com going completely off the wall and mad with it all. That's that's down to interpretation and the individual experience. But from what I've seen, it's wrecked so many people's lives that I know. And especially this lady in Twickenham, she became possessed she was smashing things up. She was wandering off like a zombie. She was seeing things. She was incredibly dangerously disturbed. And ironically now, she seems to be okay. She's got it under control. But she was channeling all the time. And it was scary stuff. When you see somebody who's just... The, the, their face changes. They're not themselves anymore. They are a different entity. I've seen and it. When, yeah. yeah well, a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of the listeners have as well. Yeah, I, that's again, that might well be a subject for another show. We may, might want to talk about Kundalini and chakras because I've been uh, doing some quite hefty research into chakras, or I was up to a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and I've even had mine removed, apparently. so. Oh, yeah, I've heard all about that one. Yeah, that, I mean, mm. this is taking things to ridiculous extremes. It's taking it to a comedy level now, I think. Do you think? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. that would be interesting anyway, because yeah. uh, that seems on, on, on the rise. But I find uh, so, some of the alternative, if you like, research in uh, chakras or opinions, theories, to be pretty interesting and make quite a lot of sense. But then so does a lot of stuff that sucks people in. Maybe I'm yeah, getting I'm, sucked in. Yeah, I'm not sure in. that, that it's, it's this, having them removed seems to be a bit daft to me but i do know that they are energy centers yeah, yeah. those energy centers are there and i studied them as part of the our body experience i i've gone a bit rusty on all that actually but i'm aware of it all okay. and the crown chakra is where a lot of this stuff comes in um that's something we can talk about another day i'd just like to finish this oh we're over the hour now aren't we yeah another another alice bailey quote i yeah. think this ties up this first part of the show quite well before we have a break tony okay nice one in, in the preparatory period for the New World Order, there will be a steady and regulated disarmament. It will not be optional. No nation will be permitted to produce and organise any equipment for destructive purposes or to infringe the security of any other nation. Now, that's a quote from her. Does that sound like the United Nations to you? It sounds very much like the United Nations. That's exactly what it is. And people who are advocating this are basically, like we said earlier, for want of a better analogy, Turkey's voting for Christmas. I suppose we should have a break now, Tony, and come back with some more in a few minutes. Yeah, let's do that. This is uh, Sublime. It's called Pawn Shop. I've checked this group out for the first time earlier on today. I was really impressed with their music, so I enjoy this one. See you in six minutes. There you go. Down here at the Pawn Shop. There's a lot of people at the Pawn Shop, but with the... Uh, poverty that there is about so i thought some of them might appreciate that quite a rare mix there of punk reggae rock music and scars quite definitely even a bit of jazz as i was just saying to mark so check them out online sublime they've got quite a lot of hits so they're obviously quite a big band and uh, i'm not sure why i've never come across them before today but i have now 
Welcome back, Mark. You're doing well in the first half. I'm really enjoying learning uh, more about how this uh, new age thing came about. So, please carry on. Well, it is interesting, Tony, because I'd looked at this for many, many years in a fairly fragmented way until it all came together with the works of Blavatsky, Bailey and the UN. I mean, ironically, it was Agenda 21 that made me put it all together properly. Previous to that, I hadn't put the whole picture together. That was in, well, go back 10, 12 years. It was coming together. But when I saw the implement all this stuff for real, then it wasn't just a concept anymore. And we know now that global governance is real. I mean, it's actually written into treaties. It's talked about by world leaders all the time, the new world order. And then you listen to things like the BBC and they talk about the new world order as a conspiracy theory when it's documented fact. I mean, these people go back to 1880 and before. You know, it's quite incredible, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it might be a conspiracy, but there's no theory about it. It's conspiracy facts, that's for sure. Absolutely. Another Alice Bailey quote is that Christians are holding back progress in spiritual movement, uh, spiritual evolution and the movement of humanity. So there's the, definitely an anti-Christian element to this because they do need to destroy that particular religion. Um, they need to make it multi-faith and meaningless. So they talk about the Maitreya. The Maitreya project is meant to be the next coming Buddha, the Buddha of loving kindness. And there's a statue in India to promote this, obviously. And of course, Buddha, I think Buddha was originally from Nepal, or what is now Nepal. It's um, in Nepal, they have these big trucks, actually. They have these Indian trucks, uh, the Tatar. Uh, you, ha- you get them in this country as well. Uh, all the truck drivers over there drive these trucks and they paint them. And it's kind of bizarre because you've got some of them have got big pictures of Bob Marley on, you know, and then um, the, a lot of them have Buddha comes from Nepal. You know, it's just it's quite bizarre. You get you go through these mountain roads and there's these brightly colored wagons with all this stuff hanging, tinsel hanging, these little um, kind of ornaments in their uh, in windows. And on the side of them, they've got these huge murals and things painted on there. So it's quite interesting, all that. And that was a very good place where I encountered a lot of the other sides of Hinduism. I was in India as well. And one thing that becomes apparent straight away that people's acquiescence has led them into dire poverty and it's okay. And the other thing that came across is that you get these organizations, say like the Brahma Kumaris in India, and outside their compound there will be people with like, one leg basically eating dirt and they just ignore them they just think well that's the way it should be those people are on their own level of evolution you know there's no compassion in it at all and that's what really shocked me is that they use this kind of acquiescence and detachment as an excuse for not engaging at all yeah i've I've had an experience like that in uh bangkok um my pals and i we got out there some years ago now 20 years ago or something and we'd only been out there. I think this was the first night we was in Bangkok and we was in the Pat Pong Market where there was a lot lot of money being spent, a lot of trade being done and uh, all the regular things going on all around you. And we're walking through the market and I see what a bit of a disturbance up in front of me in the crowd. And then the next thing I could smell this really nasty smell. It was kind of horrendous. And uh, then I looked at this site the likes of which I don't think I've seen before or since and uh, still stays with me in in my dreams sometimes. But there was this fella and he was laying on a trolley, like a skateboardy type trolley, but a bit bigger and a bit more homemade. And he was dragging himself along through the market and he literally had bits of his legs missing, bits of his hands missing. He was in a terrible state. He was covered in gangrene, which was what was causing the smell. And he sat up right in front of us and with these like little stubs for hands, put put them round this tin that was hanging round his neck and started begging for money. And uh, 
I, I, I was just appalled at this scene. Uh, how everyone could just walk by and no, nothing... I mean, this man had been like this for I don't know how long to get in the state that he'd been in. But, you know, you know it, to, to me, that was a, a massive eye-opener to what the other side of the world can be like. We talk about the harshness here, and there is harshness, but it comes in kind of different ways. I can't imagine somebody being able to go along like that on the streets over this side of the world for any length of time without someone coming along and taking care of him. That might be a bit naive on my, my behalf, but I'd like to think I'm wrong. But there was no compassion there, and there was all this money being spent now, to me, I didn't want to give the man any money. I gave him nothing. I didn't know what I could do for him. I was on holiday in another country and just got there and I've seen this and it was horrifying and I didn't want to prolong his life. If I'd had a gun, I think I might have been tempted to put him out of his misery, you know what I mean? See, it was just unbelievable, unbelievable sight. And to this day, I still dream about that and I wake up with the taste in my mouth. If, you, if you've ever smelt rotten meat... Then, then you might well know yes. what I mean. It, 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 you can still taste it years after. I've seen similar things, and that sort of idea of, yeah, they're dragging themselves along on a glorified skateboard, or well, not really a glorified skateboard, a little thing with casters on. I've seen that quite a lot. And, yeah, they just sit by the side of the road in the dust, and it's terrible. And the thing is, though, that there is also the aspect that there is dire poverty in these countries and, and it is a, a struggle for daily life that we don't have here. We don't have that at all. People moan and stuff and do people do starve to death in this country. I'm not saying they don't, but it's a different level. It's a different level there. I saw um, the most terrible disabilities and the disabled basically just get thrown out. Um, there's no welfare system for them. So I think that ties back into what we're saying, that all this stuff, all this, this indulgence and it is basically a satanic cult because there's no compassion in it at all and that's why they want to destroy Christianity in my opinion yeah I'm not sure uh, Christianity is the greatest of things but I don't want to destroy anything that other people are happy exactly. enough with not really it's not my cup of tea although the you know the foundation of it the morals behind it all I've got no problems with that at all uh, but actually getting involved I don't know I don't even want to go into that it's not what this is about because I can go on forever yeah it's interesting how all this ties in though with the Jesus story being manipulated into what we're getting zeitgeist with none of those things that they compare um, these religions to is comparable like they compare it to the ISIS Osiris and Horus story there isn't really comparison if you actually look at the real stories so what that film was doing was it was doing the work of Bailey and Blavatsky and the UN and then they threw in the 9-11 thing to get the truthers in and then they go on about the financial system so they threw in a bit of reality but basically what they're trying to get you to accept is this one world religion um, the story of Jesus as a story of pagan gods it was started by Blavatsky actually and it goes back to this idea of this new age of Aquarius and that Jesus was in some outs related or in, involved in being a Piscean and in part of the Piscean age and that the fishes represented Pisces it was all nonsense it had nothing to do with the original teachings um, and the reason I mention all that is because I'm quite interested in this um, the backgrounds of that original Christianity not the one it became but the the original teachings and also the Nag Hammadi scriptures which have some very interesting things in there about manipulation and the way we're being manipulated into basically this unity consciousness which is all about tyranny really it's it's just about being controlled yeah um, my, my observation about the Zeitgeist film and many others like it is that they kind of lead you again into this honeypot where you think that this utopian world might well exist, but they don't deal with the the big problem that we've got. They don't, don't even approach it apart from to use it to, to uh, kind of suck you in. But w what do you do with all the psychopaths and the lunatics and the paedophiles and all the rest of it in this new utopian world? Do they just come in with us, like, you know? I don't know. There, there's no... 
There's no catering for it in any of these kind of philosophies that I hear. No. No, because part of the psychological subversion is to create that. So what they're actually doing underneath all this is they're creating all of these things to they're they're letting all this stuff happen because again it helps to create a control system because once you've got a disrupted society and a confused and fragmented society which is confused about what it believes and is engaged in practices which are confusing and fractured then these people are very easy to control i mean look at the new age movement what we're talking about these people are really easy to control. They're incredibly easy to control because, of course, well, what's wrong with you? you? You seem to be negative. I get this all the time. Oh, you're being so negative. And I'm just telling them the truth. So the truth is negative, you see. So this is a huge part of it. You can't get through to these people. They are on some kind of self-indulgent, narcissistic root in life where they acquiesce from any responsibility and that was a big part of what this is all about acquiescing from your own responsibility for your own actions yeah you can't you can't just uh, ignore the negative can you especially if it's the truth and uh, another thing they like to do is uh, talk down you know responses anger and things like that i mean anger is a vital and necessary part of uh, our survival I would have thought now anger in itself left untapped or unused is uh, not necessarily a good thing to have too much of it but if you don't get angry about things then you're pretty dead inside I would have thought that's what this is about Tony yeah it's about spiritual death that's actually what the new age is about I use anger myself to do the things that I'm doing right here, right now. Now, I'm not sitting here angry and going off my rocker, but <laughs> that, that anger is used, it's channeled into an energy that I can use to do something about the things that I don't like, even if it is just sitting here waffling along. You know, that, that, that that's something. So I don't agree with that. And the other thing is the solipsism as well. You know, what's, what's that all about? That's a big part of New Age, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, God, it's it's so multidimensional to quote the New Age as all this because the yeah, the, it's very difficult to to get across to these people um, because they they seem to have these sort of stock answers like yeah, you're negative or you know oh well you're not evolved enough or it's all about again it's just about narcissism you know. And then it's very, it makes you actually more frustrated because you're dealing with, it's like dealing with people who are willfully ignorant, you know. Is, is, it, is it not a system for dumbing yourself down this new age? Because that's what it sounds like. We're, you can do the job for us, dumb yourself down with all this nonsense. Yes, exactly. And it all is about me. So what they've done, your point about solipsism is very interesting because, yeah, that's the you know, that the self is all that can exist. Well, the whole point of this is that you go outside of that. That's the whole point of, de- of development, is that yourself, you're aware that you have an awareness that you're there. This is what I get most of the time. I'm aware that I'm here. Now, someone asked me the other day, going on about, oh, but, you know, you spend loads of time on your own. Don't you get lonely? I said, no. I don't really understand what that means because I get... Um, I get restless and I want to go out and do something sometimes or meet up with people to have a laugh. But that's not really loneliness. And they, they seem to think that it's, it is all about them and the way they feel. But once you get to a certain point, it's not about that. I've got an awareness of where I am at a particular time. I mean, I've been through loads of interesting experiences recently and really bad ones, probably the worst ones I've had for years but I'm aware that I'm going through them and I just I do accept it to a certain degree because obviously you have to react in the moment but it's not about oh I feel this and I feel that I've actually I suppose that's the true idea of what these people are trying to do is is detach yourself to an extent so that you can actually have a rational 
and balanced view of what's going on, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It makes good sense. Yeah. yeah. I just find it all really disturbing. I mean, I, I find it hard now to engage with any of these people who are part of this new age stuff because I see the narcissism and the, it's like childlike ignorance that they've got. And it starts to wind you up because I start confronting them on their beliefs and then they go, oh, you've got a really angry energy. And they just what they're doing is actually winding you up because they're so stupid, you know. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. It is funny. Sorry, I'm struggling here with a couple of other bits. Uh, so where are we going next with this? Well, I mean, we've gone into these two main sort of proponents of this recent New Age thing. And I suppose we should take it into where it is now. Because where we are now is it's kind of almost post new age because it's been absorbed so much into everything, into all sorts of treatments, healing, therapies. It becomes part of this big whole, and it's and of, and what it's doing is discrediting a lot of actual really good information and therapies that's what they're actually doing um like homeopathy and all this stuff it's getting lumped in to new age yeah and that's what the media are doing now these things go back hundreds of years mm -hmm. this is the real wiccan wise stuff you know this is this is basic common sense that we are organic beings and we react organically to what is around us and what we put in our bodies that's common sense so this common sense of the ancient past or the wisdom of the ancients, whatever you want to call it, is being degraded by the new age. That's actually what's happened. And real spiritual wisdom and spiritual power is being totally denigrated by fake gurus and basically herbal remedies and silliness and mind body spirit festivals and channeling and psychics they've, they've they've lumped everything in as though everything's created now spiritualism is an interesting one because blavatsky came out of spiritualism and she was found to be a complete fraud she was investigated by the society for psychical research and found to be completely fraudulent and that's been forgotten you see so when we look at all this stuff, we've got to remember it's a bit like climate change. <laughs> if we look at these people, they were perpetuating a scientific fraud. That's what they're doing. Yep. And that's, I think, a really good direction to go with it now because when you see the extent that this has gone into people's lives and in their minds and how it has become part of the mainstream now, it's been absorbed into another cult of nothing. And they try and tar everything with the same brush. So if, you're, if you've got some really good information um, that might be to do with any kind of alternative, a so-called alternative therapy, it's very easy to tar it with the, oh, that's just new age nonsense brush. That's just, you know, that's just silly and it's, it's not proven and it's not factual. So what they've done is they've, they've, they've discredited everything of importance and they've promoted everything that is unimportant. Yeah, we see this a lot, don't we? In, <laughs> yeah, in everything, yeah. everything gets turned on its head. With, uh, what, what is it? The post-truth world, isn't it? It's pretty psychological. Yeah. Association. Association, yeah. We, I mean, the, all of this stuff is tied in and that's that's why I find it quite difficult at times to not to present it and focus it, but to know where to go with it. Because it's like a mind map. You might as well just have all these things on the screen and just go from one to the other and point out where they all actually relate. You know, um, because we don't need to listen to hours and hours and hours of lectures by people to actually put this together it's actually quite simple and 
what we were talking about with the communist subversion techniques that Yuri Besnamov was talking about in the 80s and how he subverted people and got them on the side of the Soviets. It's the same thing. They're using exactly the same techniques and the goal is the same. The goal is exactly the same. It's to destroy individual freedom and replace it with a consensus reality that everybody appears to agree. And if you don't appear to agree, then there's something wrong with you. So it's iron fist communism, and all this has been promoted through these organizations which were aligned to the UN. And there are hundreds of them. I'd like to go into more of those in the weeks to come. But I've told you about my experiences with the Brahma Kumaris, and we've talked about the orange people, the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh cult, with people saying, well, why? We live in a world of abundance. Why shouldn't you have 100 Rolls Royces? Well, wait a minute. If you're a spiritual master, what do you need 100 Rolls Royces for? That's right. Because everything material is an illusion, isn't it? So what do you want illusion for? Apparently. That's mayor, That's mayor isn't it? That's more, illusion. <laughs> yeah, more hypocrisy. There's a, there's a comment from Lee. He says, in this duality, the system is going to give you two options. Are you inclusive or exclusive? Pick one. Duality as a principle will be erased like every other cult apart from the Luciferian, it seems. Well, that's exactly right. It's like, it's the same as saying you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. That's, that's what they're saying, basically. Yeah. It's saying when the UN says with Agenda 21 that nobody will be left out, what they mean is nobody will be allowed to stay out of it. Yes. And those that stay out of it, and this is a quote, another thing that's very interesting is that, and this was quoted by Alice Bailey, the people who are not part of this will be destroyed. Mm. That's what she's saying. So all of those outside this free Freemasonic New Age cult will be destroyed. They're telling you. That's part of the plan. So these people, when they go on about Hitler, these people were much worse in my opinion, because their their belief systems are still going and and they are now in place. You know, they're going about Nazi ideology. Yeah. Well, that finished, that's gone. When, when, you, when we hear people talk about Nazis, it's pathetic. It's used by these vile organizations like Hope Not Hate and basically the intelligence services. So they they have to use that word. But this is much, much worse because... You can well, you can watch New Age documentaries and they'll say, and like, and like Hitler, Blavatsky was influenced by, you know, the Aryan race and all this. Well, this is all kind of waffly subjectiveness. It's not, it's, it's, it's not getting to the meat and potatoes of it. When you actually get Blavatsky stating that Lucifer is God, is the God that they channel, and Satan is their God, well, that's taking it a step further, in my opinion. Yes, we've had some uh, pretty amazing synchronicity going on here tonight, uh, lots of it. Now, one bit was earlier on, to, uh, you were talking about Mahatma uh, being called up by, uh, I think it was, uh, what's her name, H.P. Bravatsky. Yeah, Bravatsky, yeah. Bravatsky, right. So, um, at that time, Mahatma put a comment in the chat, and uh, I was going to just go back to it at some point here, but you just started talking right along the lines of this again, and I've got to say, there's been sort of like five or six so far, really mad bits of uh, synchronicity. But this one is, the Nazis' foundation was theosophy. Theosophy? Yes. Well, according to certain sources, it was. But we don't know how true that is. I mean, people repeat these things as though they're true. But, I mean, apart from looking at... I've been to Paderborn the castle, with the runic inscriptions on the floor. Now, this goes back to the Teutonic Knights and stuff like that. This goes back to about the 11th, 12th century. So there's nothing new about any of this. There's nothing Aryan cultish about it. It, was, it all came from the order of the Teutonic Knights who fought with the Knights Templar, who were merely the Germanic and um, Scandinavian branch of the Knights Templar. They, they, they decided to work together with them. And the Teutonic Knights, and we hear a lot of this stuff about Teutonic beliefs and the Teutonic Knights and the system, um, that is more aligned to 
ancient Germany. So why wouldn't they be using that? I don't see a huge influence of theosophy on the Nazis. I see it being put onto them as national so. You see, the thing is, we're talking about national socialism, but there was a, there was um, a documentary series on the History Channel called "The Occult History of the Third Reich." Now, they did some very interesting work on all this, but was that an integral part of their belief system? Was it an integral part of national socialism? This is something we can discuss. I mean, I'm not an expert on this at all, but if you've got a race of people the Germ- the, the, and the Germanic people have been pretty much destroyed, they've been destroyed by what happened in, the, in, in two world wars, and they were advanced at one point. And they've been knocked back. So I can't see that the, they were overly influenced by theosophy. I've never actually seen the evidence of that, and I'd love to see it. And I'm sure that the, there might be some good evidence. But I always, when I looked at the occult history of the Third Reich, <clears throat> I saw there it was a Teutonic thing that they were going back to. And that's been pretty much written out of history. And the Teutonic Knights were nothing bad. They were just protecting their own interests and their country. Eventually, they worked with the Templars. Uh huh. Well, I've been reading Mahatma's chat and yeah. researching on him, uh, the things that he's said, because he often goes against a lot of what gets said on different shows. And uh, he's not normally wrong, and he doesn't normally say anything without something to back it up. And what he says here is Nazi ideology came from theosophy, and that's a fact. So we were looking forward to uh, finding out where that information comes from and having a look into it, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, and give us the sources. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it. I know I've seen it stated as a fact. I've seen it stated as an absolute fact. Um, I mean, Hitler was influenced by mystical things there's no doubt about that but i suppose it depends on what sort of time we're talking about because he went through some very strange phases and he he was given drugs at certain points i mean i i I did start to look into all this but yeah okay so they were in so they were influenced by theosophy but does it matter now it doesn't really does it does it matter I i don't know whether it matters or not um it's a fact okay it's a fact um, I'd like to see more of the sources on that, though, and see the links between Blavatsky and what became the National Socialists. Um, I haven't actually seen any direct links, but I haven't really looked, to be fair. So, yeah, I'm sure that there's something in it. But, again, I was sticking to the point about their belief system coming from Arianism and all the rest of it, which is very confused as well, because when they talk about Arians, they're not, you know, there's there's several different interpretations of what that actually means. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Lee's broke quite a bit, and I'll save some of this for later, maybe next week. But uh, Stu's just come in with one. Is it illegal to boycott Israel yet? Right out of the blue, that one. But it's pretty relevant because at the moment, I do know that there's a bill going through in America, or they're trying to get one through, for uh, making it illegal to boycott Israeli goods or have any protests or anything. So have you got anything on that for Stu? Well, I think that it reflects something that is good in the respect that they're obviously scared that people are now seeing through the whole thing. So I suppose, in a way, it reflects their fear. Yes, we've got some more hypocrisy here as well. I mean, we're we're being told constantly about all the surveillance and the business that's going on and poking their nose into our computers and whatever. If you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. So what is it that the Israelis have got to hide? That's what I want to know. Well, I already well, exactly. know it. <laughs> I already know, but... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we can go on about that and on and on about it. I mean, I've done lots of research into that sort yeah. of particular avenue and it's... Again, an interesting one. But getting back to this, I think it's more, it's kind of the way this ties into global governance. And basically, yeah, it ties into psychology, communism, and all the stuff we've been talking about. So it's just merely a different aspect of that. So all they're doing is they're mopping up people who are pretty gullible, who 
want to think of themselves as special, who are very narcissistic and and they want to be spiritual. I mean, you go to these places. I mean, there's, you see a lot of these people all over the world. You know, the, the, this is the thing that it's been going on for a long time, especially since air travel got cheaper in the 60s, I suppose. They've, you know, these places have become the destinations of the hippies. And I know a lot of people are involved in all these different cults. And they're not bad people. It's just that it's an artificial womb that's that's been designed to go nowhere and to entrap you into a belief system that accepts your own slavery. Uh -huh. Some, something I thought of during the break, uh, and I don't know whether it's relevant or not, but I thought I'd ask you, Edgar Casey, where, if at all, does he fit into this? Well, I read some of his stuff, and it's all, again, it's, it's about channeling. And the books I read, I couldn't see that he'd actually predicted anything. But I'm probably wrong. I don't like channeled information. I find it boring, to be honest, because it's well, it's about nothing. It's it's he it was he was massively promoted, Ed, Edgar Casey, yeah, and it was all about the Atlantis stuff, which ties into Blavatsky because she was really into Lemuria, Mu, and the Atlantis theory, and that's where a lot of this philosophy came from. I've no idea about Atlantis apart from what Plato said. I've got my own theories, and, and I believe that the British Isles could have been part of that lost continent because if you look at the way it's been pulverised and we've been smashed apart from Scandinavia and Ireland, then it is interesting, if not provable, that it could be due to a comet. And I looked into this years ago. We, we are still working on a film in the background um, called Britain Shattered Isles, which goes into the work of Commons Beaumont, which originally I thought was rather far-fetched and rather silly. And he does make some preposterous statements, which are hugely funny, actually. But when I looked into it, and Doggerland, which is um, it's not some place in Essex, by the way, where you pull your car up. <laughs> it's a place that's under the sea. Yeah, Two Tree Island, Leon Sea. <laughs> yeah, Doggerland, yeah. yeah. And um, it's, it is an interesting thing that there was a landmass under the sea between us and Scandinavia, and it was all connected. And there is this theory that we were part of this very important landmass, and it does make sense. I mean, looking into it from a historical point of view, why has Britain been so important? And if you go back thousands of years, you can think, well, OK, well, the, the whole of the climate's changed. There has been a total change of climate on the planet. And we were in a different kind of atmosphere then. It was totally different. So it's very it's very interesting but it's it starts to blow your mind after a while because you're looking into this stuff and you know it can it can start and end wherever you want it and i think that takes us back to what we're talking about the new age because all of this stuff is put out there by the gurus as though it's channeled information so it's fact no it's information that you have no direct experience of so, in other words, it's hearsay. But whose hearsay is it? Yeah. And this brings us to the most important point, uh, what we were talking about just before the break, I think. The channeled entities, what are they? What are they? I mean, well, when you, we create... So I would have thought that you've only got their word for who, they, who and what they are. I, well, I, this is very interesting. It takes us back to Blavatsky, because when I was younger, we did a lot of seances. And we tried to summon up people who were very famous. And what we got was misleading, destructive, and very bad energy coming back. There was no great revelation made. There was disruption caused. Disruption actually came into the room in certain experiences we'd had. And in one case, someone got really heavily targeted by this entity and got really, really freaked out. And it took them quite a long time to recover. And we did this as kids, playing around with it. But the experiences I had later, I did realize that this channeled information is probably just lower level entities which are there. They're like petty minded bureaucrats, basically. They're people who want to mess your life up. So if they're lower dimensional entities 
And this is why Bat- Blavatsky and Bailey wanted to think they were channeling higher dimensional entities. How would they know that? Exactly, I mean, they wouldn't. They've just got their word for it. I, oh, exactly. I, 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 yeah. I relate it to things that I know, try and simplify things. If we look into hacking in today's world, we get uh, the, the, the people that really know what they're doing and are running things are pretty much no one knows who they are or what they're doing. But then you've got this lower layer of what they call script kiddies. And these are people that are just sort of like trying to get in, into this business and they make out they're something they're not just because they can do a little bit of that, this, that and the other. And they cause all sorts of aggro on their way. And uh, it sounds like it could be a similar scenario with the spirit world. I don't know whether that's a very good analogy or not. I think it's, it's a brilliant one, Tony, because I wrote down that. I was going to say it and I forgot that basically these people are chances. They are archetypal chances. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, no problem. I can do this. I can do that. I can, yeah, I can do that as well. Oh, yeah, I'll come around and do that. Yeah, no problem. I'm good at fixing them. Yeah. And when it comes down to it, they can't do anything. So it's, an, it's a brilliant analogy because – all of this stuff and all of these people I've known around spiritualism, there's some very dark aspects to it. There's one spiritualist church that I know where there's a guy who's definitely meddling around with seriously bad black magic. And what are they getting out of it? Does anybody come and give them an amazing revelation? Look at these TV psychics and these, this spiritual stuff. They all say, oh, well, he passed over. He, it was difficult in the end. He wants to know you're all right. He, you know, he wants to know that he, want, he wants you to know that you're all right, and and he's happy now, and he's he's doing what he wants to do. They, they always come out with this vague stuff. I mean, some of them are quite accurate, actually. The man is under the mattress. This is it. And but these people were just—they're basically like fairground showmen um, who've been given far too much power. Blavatsky and Bailey. They. They would just roll up, roll up, look at this, the Siamese twins, the Siamese, you've never seen anything like it in your life, and you go in there and it's a jar. And it's just got this couple of sort of little creatures in it, you know, and you go, oh, right, okay. And you've paid them um, fibre to get in. And the guy gives you a sort of guilty look on the way out and then starts shouting, roll up, roll up again, you know. It's a bit like that. I mean, it's all about disappointment and yeah, those those experiences I had with those low level entities that uh, which I believe they're channeling, it's just nonsense. It's self referencing. I think they're just self referencing their own egos, basically. Um, and this this idea of channeled information is absolutely ludicrous because you get this these books written on it. I read one of them. One of them was recommended by David Icke, and it was called Earth by Barbara Marciniak, and it was meant to be all about the Palladians or something. And it's just an absolute load of waffle. And you just think, what is the point of this? What am I going to learn from it? Nothing. Yeah, because there, is, there is, does seem to be a growing number of people that claim to be in communication with these Palladians as well. It seems a bit disturbing to me, but it's a similar thing. And uh, I'm wondering how you feel about this, because I, I heard someone, I don't know how long ago, quite a while back now, and I can't even remember who it was, but they were saying that, Angels, demons, aliens, spirits, they're, they're all the same thing, but they manifest themselves depending on the person and, and, and their line of thinking, you know? What do you think about that? I think there is some truth in that, but, again, it's getting a bit vague now. I am not aware of angels, but I think that there are certain affirmations that people do that, that can protect them, whether that's because they have belief in it and it protects them, is kind of beside the point. But what I do know is that the lower level, these demons or these kind of disturbed entities, which are what they call the hungry ghosts in some of these religions like Buddhism, they leave bits of rice out for hungry ghosts, which are basically these people who can't they can't pass on to the next level. They're still in the troposphere, in the lower troposphere, as ghosts. And we see them sometimes. And they're the sort of people who used to hang around the pub every day and didn't have anywhere to go. I've had experience of this. I've seen people, um, where, this is my own experience, but those sort of people, they remain ghosts because they don't really want to move on and they're kind of stuck. Some people, they we did some experiments with our body stuff where... They had this idea that there was people who needed help 
who'd had um, trauma, like they'd been in a bomb, uh, that a bomb had gone off or they'd been in a war zone and they didn't know what happened to them. So their thought was that they could get them out of there because they were confused. They didn't know where they were. This is all possible, but again, very subjective stuff. Um, as far as the demonic side of it goes, people channeling this stuff, I know that that's real. I've been around people who've really messed about with it and I've seen it coming through drugs with people and I've, I've seen it and the effects of that have, have been very disturbing in certain times of my life and I know that that is real. That is one thing I do know is real. That sort of energy and negative attachment, I've seen it on people. I, I'm, I've done facial clairvoyance. I've seen this stuff and the, the danger is with all this new age stuff with these Blavatsky's and the Baileys and the and the ones that came after them Benjamin Krem and all these people there's, there's a whole load of them we can go into but they they are encouraging people into a system which they don't fully understand and there does only seem to be a, a, a good defense against this stuff is is a very strong spiritual response but these people haven't got that because they've given away their own spiritual power. So they're susceptible to this stuff coming in. And and often it's not that damaging. It's a bit negative and it just causes friction. But the more powerful ones, I've seen the damage that they can do and they destroy the host. They destroy the person. The person d descends into complete mental illness, schizophrenia, and they destroy everything around them until they are themselves destroyed by the entity. And I've seen that happen. And it's something that I find to be the most disturbing aspect of the whole new age because these people are allowing themselves to be taken over by things that they have no idea about, you know. And there was a reason why priests were inducted into this sort of stuff in the past. And these things had to be controlled. Because people do summon them up. You know, I mean, this has been going on a long time. It's part of voodoo, which voodoo is part of Catholicism. It's a, you know, this voodoo and Catholicism go together. They, they were brought Catholicism and they've still got voodoo in Haiti. But that's not unusual. It's, it's, not an, it, it's, it's actually the norm. It's the norm with a lot of these people. And a lot of these aristocratic families were involved in Satanism. I mean, I visited a place last week. And there's no doubt in my mind that the people who had this family seat for hundreds and hundreds of years, which is now in the National Trust, were Satanists. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And what I've heard about the story that was going to come out, which we're working on at the moment. But these, there are people on this planet who are involved in Satanism, but it doesn't help when you've got all this sensational stuff written about it, satanic ritual abuse and all that, because a lot of these stories are in my view, there to distract from what is really going on, because this stuff is happening, I'm sure it's happening, but the stories that are getting fed a lot to the alternative media are cover stories, and what people need to do is get real good investigative journalists in there and not put this stuff out into the public domain until they've got all the information, because that's what generally happens. This stuff comes out as hearsay, and it's shut down, but it needs proper investigation and not hearsay. Otherwise, that's just going to play into the hands of the enemy, you know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Mifrin is saying in the chat about what you were talking about earlier with the Ouija board and that. He says, uh, yeah, Mark, but if you're playing with a Ouija board and a dirty old wine glass with no guidance, you will get low-level entities. No, it's not what I was talking about. I was talking about um, those are generally what's there. I mean... I don't know whether whether he's referring to. I don't quite understand what he, what he means by dirty old wine glass. But the the point is that I've been to a lot of these spiritualist meetings, which aren't Ouija boards. I've done the Ouija board thing, and my experience of it is that the the entities that are attracted to that sort of thing are there to disrupt. And I did quite a lot of in, um, work on this. I don't have anything to do with it anymore because I know how easy it is for these things to come into uh, dimensional experience. They have to be invited in, but by doing that, you are inviting them in. 
So it's best not to invite them in at all, in my opinion. Um, any kind of channeled information to me or anything that comes to these sources has to be questioned. It's I used to go by intuition a lot. I still go by intuition is not the same thing. Intuition is where you know something's right or wrong. And that is what people, in my view, should be working on. Take away all these, all this self-deception and and um, work on this subtleness of, of, of intuition about knowing whether something's right or wrong, you know. Yeah, well, my friend's agreeing with what you said there, and he also said earlier in reference yeah. to, uh, you know, people that don't know what they're doing and uh, stuff like that, he says, I did that, Mark. They are yeah. called rescue circles. So, in other words, he made a rescue yeah. circle. So they used to do that. And uh, Mahatma's saying the Hampstead hoax is a prime example of ritual abuse being poo-pooed. Agreed. Well, yes. I mean, we haven't got time to go into that. It's, it's time to finish the show. But in conclusion, I mean, I had I had some quotes that I was going to read out at the beginning, uh, sorry, the end of the show. Let's go back to some of those quotes. Um, I've got some really good stuff here from yeah we've, we've done I think we've done the actual main ones from from Huxley but here's a good one from um, oh yeah here's a good Huxley one the further a society drifts from truth the more it will hate those who speak it one from George Orwell the shutting down of free speech and human rights under the banner of diversity and empowerment oh hang on that's not George Orwell that's me <laughs> <laughs> that was George Orwell. The further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Sorry, I'm getting my notes mixed up here. But um, what I've said is the shutting down of free speech and human rights under the banner of diversity and empowerment, setting minority groups up against the free speech of others is now fully in place. And here's a little quote that I made up for the show. The lie is all around you. The truth is always within you. Those who externalize the lie cannot know the truth. And that's a little quote from me. And I'm sure Blavatsky and... Um, um, Bailey would have dined out on that one for a few weeks. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice one. I'd, I'd like to get some uh, voiceovers of these quotes and get some of them up on uh, on a page on the site as well if I ever find some time to do something like that because there's some good stuff there and yours is as good as any of them. Well done. Uh, Thanks, Tony. Yeah. I just thought that the, basically the truth is within us. You know, we don't need all this nonsense and rubbish and fake spirituality and fake religion. Because under, if we go by natural law, which was what I keep saying, we, the truth is there. The yeah. truth is natural law. That's keep, all it is. Keep it simple, eh? Mm. Exactly. Right. You was excellent tonight, Mark. I've really enjoyed that, and I'm looking forward to next week as well. So thanks to everyone for joining us. It's been great in the chat there. I'm going to make a note of all those notes because there's so much gone by in there. Oh, definitely. Excellent contributions. We'll be doing more on this, no doubt. We said in the break that we could probably do a lifetime on it because it's that uh, convoluted now and in, in every part, as Mark has said. So uh, look forward to next week. Cheers for listening, everyone. Have a good week. Cheers, Mark. Thanks, Tony. See you next week. Oh.